Our first session of our conference today is titled, This or That, Making Money Moves. In this session, all of our panelists are from Ally Invest. We have Callie Cox, our Senior Investment Strategist, Jack Howard, the Senior Director of Wealth Advisor Operations, and Nicole Culp, Senior Director of Ally Invest Advisors. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Thank you, Brian. Hello, everybody. As he mentioned, I'm Jack Howard, and this is our first panel of the day. Um, this or that making money moves. So do you ever wonder what you should do first with your money? Is it paying down debt, saving for a house? Should you start investing? Well, during this session, my colleagues and I are going to talk about how we approach it. But first, let's look at the results from the poll. So it looks like everybody, we have a lot of rookies. So 44% of you said that you are a rookie and just starting your investing journey where you are in the right place today. So I'm, I'm, I guarantee you'll learn a ton today that'll help you. So now that we have the, the poll behind us, Callie and Nicole, let's jump into this conversation. Um, I'm a huge fan of understanding how did you get here? What is your money story? So I asked my colleagues to take a money personality quiz that was created by an author, Amanda Steinberg. So if we could just jump into that first, tell us your personality and a little bit about your history. All right, I'll jump in first. Well, I'm Callie Cox. I'm a senior investment strategist, as Brian said. Um, and, you know, I grew up uh, in a lower middle class family, um, you know, had a few tough times, um, had some points where, you know, I wish we could have afforded more. And that turned into money insecurity, honestly. Um, and I think the idea of exploring your experiences and their connection to money is really interesting because, you know, money is emotional, whether you like it or not. And things that happen to you in your childhood and growing up can affect how you think about money uh, all the way through your life. So, uh, you know, taking my experiences, I actually took the quiz that Jack sent us. And according to the quiz, I'm a producer. So let me tell you what that means. I'm supposedly, and I believe this, but... <laughs> The quiz says I'm very diligent and methodical with money. And, you know, I'm always thinking about my saving and investments. You know, basically, I think about money way too much. And that can be a blessing and a curse. You know, I think I'm overly conservative. I probably don't take enough risk on, um, but it fits my personality. I'm overall like a very low risk person, um, but I'm hardworking. I'm diligent. And sometimes I need to let lo loose a little. So, Nicole, tell us about your personality. Yeah. Yeah, Kelly, thank you. So um, I too am a huge fan of understanding like your behaviors, right? Like what biases or behaviors are you bringing to the table when it comes to making decisions? And so taking this uh, money personality test was right up my alley. And uh, I, was a, I was a perfect split. So like you, Kelly, uh, half of me was uh, a producer. So I, too, um, grew up in, in an environment where there was a lot of financial insecurities. And I would say that um, in those formative years, for me, money always equated stress. Um, however, if I look back upon like that time in my life, there is no better budgeter on this planet, and I'm talking to all of you single moms out there, than a single mom. My mom was um, you know, divorced when I was very early. She was a teen mom. And so she had to make it work, right? Like budgeting was it, what we did. Like you, you, we sat down, it was like a family event. We sat down um, every Saturday, I remember, and I was in charge of the checkbook and had to write out the check. And that gave me a, an understanding early on of just what things cost. However, what it also did, and this is where that money um, personality kind of really struck a chord with me, was it gave me a lot of anxiety, right? Seeing that what we had in the bank account was going, going until there was nothing left led to a lot of stress in my life, like, you know, around money. Um, so that producer side of me kind of handled that. And what helped me, at least during that time, was um, or as I got older and realized this was an insecurity in my life, was creating a, um, an emergency fund. So once I had that little emergency fund, as small as it was at the time, it at least gave me that peace of mind. Um, so that was one side of me. But the other side of me, which I find um, just as interesting and very much on point, was a visionary. And so what visionaries are is that they're really driven to do what they love for work. Um, they get equally excited when that work is 
is financially rewarding as well. And so I'm happy to be here at Ally. So I'm at a place that I love doing something that I love. So it really feeds into that visionary side of me. However, with the risks of a visionary, they can be impulsive um, and they could be risk takers. So I do see that kind of come up um, with me, especially when it, when it comes to the way I invest. Sometimes probably take on a little more risk than I should. Um, but then usually I have that producer side of me, the, the angel on the other shoulder telling me to be a little more cautious. Like both of you, I love this idea of thinking through like how we got to this place with our money. Um, so I'm a connoisseur, which means I'm a spender and I like money. So I like money. I like making money. I like accumulating money. I like watching it. I like spending it and spending it on quality experiences and things that bring me joy. Um, and that that's very true for me from the quiz. Um, I think growing up for me, my parents, um, I'm the daughter of a police officer and a teacher, and they worked really hard to provide a great life for my siblings and I. Um, there were times where we had a lot of money and times where we didn't have as much money. Um, so I remember that growing up, but overall, my mom would oversee the finances for the house and she made it work. All of my, my siblings and I went to private school. It was a good life. Then my mom passed suddenly when I was 12 and things really changed for us. My dad wasn't as good with money. Um, so I real, I realized by the time I got to be like 15, I got my first job at McDonald's, right? And that's when I learned that I could take control of my finances and I never looked back. So for me, um, having the ability to earn and have income was a big deal for me um, throughout my life. It's still that way. And, and when we think about this money story, it made me sit back and think like, what is my attachment to things and income and all of that? And the story that I historically told myself was, I needed a high income to take care of myself income equated to security. I felt like the best experiences had to be expensive. And I felt like I was just a spender. And I think as you get older, uh, things change. So life happens. For me, I got married and I got divorced. I'm a breast cancer survivor. I've had breast cancer when I was 30. Um, and even most recently with COVID, it all shifted my perception to money and, and how we look at things. So now my perspective, I'm still a spender and I have to navigate that by staying away from debt and really putting up guardrails. But my mindset shifted to more of, um, you know, instead of income equaling security, my net worth is my security because you can make a lot of money and spend it all. Um, also thinking of how joyful experiences don't have to cost a lot. It could be me going to yoga class or picking out a bouquet of flowers. Um, and also like letting go some of that control that I have that I think was a result of my childhood with my mom passing and and even with my my healing journey from cancer, it was this mindset that you got to live for today because you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Um, but knowing that I can plan for the future and I can have other people support me. Um, and it's OK that I'm a spender. I think that's something that I was ashamed of in the past. And I would force myself to be this saver and frugal. And it was like I was dying on the inside. But for me, it was more so putting up those guardrails to ensure that I would still be successful with my money. Um, so that's our stories, ladies. Thank you for sharing. All right, now let's get into a little bit of this or that. Okay, um, so Nicole, do you pay cash or take out debt? Ooh, Jack, this is a good one. An interesting one to kick off knowing too how I feel about money, right? Um, so I'm a firm believer that really debt is a tool. And I liken it to a hammer, right? So either a hammer can make something great or it can really cause significant damage. So that's how I approach debt when I think about it. Um, and so the way, I, the way I go into that decision-making uh, process is if I can borrow money at a lower interest rate than I can earn on that money, I tend to invest it, right? So um, there are things that we'll always pay cash for. My husband and I don't like having a lot of credit card. Like we don't have credit card debt. We pay off our credit card every month. But there are things that, you know, I do pay cash for. However, I realize also that, um, you know, in my early 20s, I got into trouble with debt um, and it impacted my credit score. So I spent a good part of my late 20s, early 30s, really trying to rehabilitate um, that credit score and debt was the way to do that, right? So I had to take on debt 
kind of rehabilitate that score. So um, the risk that I looked at when I was taking on that debt was, you know, the, the thought, the hovering over my head at all times is what happens if I default on this? So knowing that that money is a stressor um, and that I have a natural inclination to save, I would always have like an emergency fund to pay off that debt should something happen, right? And, I, and either I, I lost a job, my income was reduced, or heaven forbid, you know, something happened to me from a health pre from a health perspective. I always had that money to pay that debt. So that provided me, you know, that peace of mind that I needed. The second thing that, um, you know, I always think about when I when I have this internal dialogue with myself of cash or takeout debt, is to also realize too that, you know, your investments don't always perform well. The market is volatile, and if I am um, taking out debt and I'm putting that money to work for me. Um, I tend to do it in something a little more conservative, so I don't lose that money, right? It's it's that kind of peace of mind emergency fund that I have built up. Um, so yeah, so I think that is a two-edged sword, right? You get in trouble with it, it's just like that hammer. Um, if used wisely, it can build something beautiful. If um, you know, in the wrong hands, it can cause significant damage. So those are the those are the two things that I weigh out um, around the risks um, when I think about debt versus cash. How about you, Kelly? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I think this is a really interesting question, and my answer is going to sound a lot like Nicole's. Um, but, you know, I'll tell you what I do now, and I'll tell you why I got there and why I made this decision. So I actually utilize debt as a tool, too. I think that there is such a thing as smart debt. Um, of course, high interest debt uh, is debt that you really should think twice before taking on. But credit cards fall into that pile. And honestly, I use my credit cards all the time. I love getting the points and I love having the security in case I purchase something and I have to you know, dispute the charge or I have to refund it. Um, so I do use credit cards. I make sure no matter what that I pay them off at the end of the month because once that high interest kicks in, it's a huge snowball effect and it's hard to get control back of it. Um, and I pay cash uh, you know, for bigger, I put down down payments for um, bigger purchases um, and I'll tell you why too. So debt is a tool. Um, you know, auto loans, you can typically get them at lower rates. You know, sometimes that makes sense. And, you know, I'm thinking about getting a car at the end of this year and I'll probably get it. I'll take out debt for that. But if you pay cash, you put a down payment down, you might be able to get better financing terms. Or if you, you know, put a down payment down on a house, you could come in, you could get better financing terms, or you could come in as a strong buyer. So I like to pay cash when it's advantageous to me. I just basically look at the advantages. I'm like, you know what? If the interest rate is low enough and I'm confident I can pay it off, that's the other side of the coin too. You got to be confident and you have to pay it off. You have to make your payments. But, you know, if the interest rate is low, I'm confident I can pay it off. I will take out debt. But if I have an advantage by using cash, then I'll use cash. And I'll admit too, I'm very fortunate to be in that position. Um, and it, it hasn't always been that way. You know, I... I have my you know, share of money struggles in my 20s too. I lived in New York and there's a money fairy that uh, flies around New York and sucks all the cash out of your wallet. So <laughs> I had a bunch of, I took a bunch of cash advantage, advances. Um, I knew that wasn't the right thing, but you know, I had to do it to get by. So I value the position I'm in right now, but I know that it's, I know that it's a struggle and I know that um, you know, sometimes you don't have the cash. So bottom line, don't view debt badly, just be smart about it. You know, something you mentioned, Callie, that rings true for me, and it's like, it was music to my ears when you said it, is that with debt, you have to pay it off, right? I think sometimes we get into trouble with debt where you think it's like additional income for you. And that's how I was in my 20s, right? So I graduated from college with about $40,000 in student loan and credit card debt. Um, and it, it, it was very impactful for me. I spent like all of my late twenties and early thirties paying off that debt and building my credit. So because of that and knowing my money personality, this is where I think knowing your personality is so important. I know that I can't handle a lot of debt. So I generally try to avoid it as much as possible. Um, so when I have large ticket items, for example, this summer, I'm doing a big landscaping project at my house. I have a few vacations planned and I've literally paid cash for it. I've been just setting aside the money for it each pay. Um, 
Um, and I also um, just really try to avoid credit card debt. Now, for those larger purchases, like my vehicle, my house, I went to grad school, I had student loans for that. You have to take out loans. But for even those things, I aggressively paid off my student loans. And then also for my car loan and mortgage, I make payments every two weeks. So for me, it's important that knowing that I'm a spender, I would prefer to know that I'm paying down debt aggressively to avoid thinking that I have more cash than I do and I'll spend it on something I don't need to spend it on. Um, so I want to my goal at retirement is to have zero debt, none, zero, zero. OK, Callie, back to you. Splurging versus saving. Oh, man, I feel seen. I feel seen. All right, guys. So, you know, I'm a producer. You know, I love my saving. And saving, anybody will tell you, saving up, having that emergency fund can give you some great peace of mind. I had a friend who actually compared it to, um, you know, a mental dividend. Like, okay, maybe you're not making as much money on it, but you have, you feel that safety and you can sleep at night. So I love saving and I, I implore everybody to look at at least building up three to six months of emergency savings that will make you feel better. On that note, I am very bad at splurging. And again, I know that it sounds like a blessing, but I'm telling you it's a curse. Um, so I, you know, I have trouble splurging. I think way too much about what I'm spending um, to the point where I feel like I overthink small purchases and that's usually not good. I mean, that's some mental gymnastics that you shouldn't have to go through. So, you know, I think that splurging has a place in a budget. Um, you know, you've saved a lot and I think it's totally fine to reward yourself. In life is for the living and you can't, you know, take all that with you. So definitely splurge from time to time. Um, that's something that I'm trying to work on too. Again, I know it sounds, <laughs> I know it sounds kind of crazy, but my husband and I are actually planning a trip later this year. And, you know, I, I spent more money than, you know, I wanted to on the hotel, the lodging. So, um, you know, I'm making steps there and it's something that comes from my, my money and security, but I keep reminding myself okay, you've saved up your emergency fund. You're going to be good if something happens. So why not treat yourself a little bit? How about you, Nicole? Yeah, Jack. So um, I feel like Callie and I on this one are, are probably aligned. So Callie and I will never go on vacation together because we will never leave the hotel room or buy anything. So <laughs> um, I think where where I, I fall into this is I can easily have buyer's remorse or guilt when spending on splurges. Um, so there's a couple ways, and, and it's funny because like part of me realizes that splurges, you, you need them, right? Like you need a little, you need to treat yourself a little bit, right? So um, the way for me to get past that guilt and that buyer's remorse is the tried and true envelope strategy. So I go back to the days of that single mom that I had in my my widowed Nana, who literally used envelopes, right? Like their, their paycheck was here, they cashed it, um, they used their envelopes, we had our grocery envelope, we had other envelopes, but um, you know, times have changed. My envelopes are now digital. So um, the way I, I look at splurging now is almost as a savings component similar to Cali. So um, I still use envelopes, but I'm going to give a little plug for, for Ally here is I actually use um, their savings buckets because I have a splurge savings bucket. Um, and when that, you know, when, when I see something I like, and I'll, I'll say like, there are a few things I splash out on, but sheets, I love a good sheet, right? Like you spend, you spend eight hours a day in those things. So I want, I want to pamper myself with sheets. So um, when I see a good deal on very nice French linen sheets, my one splurge, I go to that savings bucket and I, I don't feel as guilty or I don't have the buyer's remorse so readily that I typically would have. So, um, Jack, knowing that you're a connoisseur, I'd love to know how you balance these two. Yeah, so I think we all should go on vacation together because I will help you to spend and have an amazing experience and you'll help me to like have a retirement. Um, but no, seriously, I I'm, I do like a good splurge, right? As a, a connoisseur, a spender, um, a splurge is, it's in me. It's in my DNA, kind of. In my younger years, that got me into a lot of trouble with credit card debt. So to get around that, now I automate everything. If you, um, I have this chat with my, my girlfriends where we talk about money and we talk about, that's my hack. Like I automate everything. 
And with that, it means my emergency savings, my retirement, my 529 for my kids, and all of my bills are automated. Everything is automated. So it never, I never have to worry about it. It gets out of my account before I can ever touch it. So that helps me. Also, I'm sensible with my splurges. I've become more sensible, shall I say. Um, I love fancy restaurants and trying new food. So, but I don't eat a lot of food. So I try to split my meals with my friends when we go out. That helps me to save money. I also like fashion and shopping for great new items. Um, to get around that, I buy designer items from a consignment shop. Or I'll use a rental service when I have like a fancy event and I need a gown. I also hired, this may sound like a splurge, but it was actually smart for me. I hired a fashion stylist who helps me to actually shop. So that is a major guardrail for me because I have, I know that I'm only going to shop two times a year. I know what I need and she helps me to buy it. Um, finally, as I mentioned earlier, I made a list of things that bring me joy. And when I historically would feel like I need retail therapy and that would be a splurge, I don't do that anymore. Now I can go to my list and that includes my morning run, yoga, meditation, and fresh flowers. So I think it's just getting back to knowing yourself and, and what's best for you. For me, it's automating and being sensible with the splurges. Okay, ladies, back to Nicole. When does it make sense to take on debt? Oh, I'm glad you asked me this one, because as I was thinking about the, the first part question around pay cash or take out debt, I was thinking also like there, there are times where it makes sense, right? And I, Callie alluded to some of them. So, you know, as I referenced back, the debt is a tool. So you have to be really smart about taking on debt. Um, so, you know, I, I have a, a, a background where I helped a lot of people's financial planning. So there's some general rules around that, like that. Your total debt, which would include your mortgage, should not exceed about 36% of your household gross income. So, you know, if, if you are thinking about taking on debt, be mindful of that, right? Uh, get a better understanding of, of you know, that debt to income ratio and try to keep it around 30, 36%. Um, you know, every family situation is different, but I really think that there's probably, for me, three areas, or four, where it really makes sense to kind of take on debt. So the first being higher education, um, the second housing, um, the third might be starting a business, and then the fourth is really just transportation. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll kind of pepper this in with like some stage planning advice, but then also kind of what I did too. You know, college, it's not an inexpensive proposition. So, um, you know, it may make sense there to take on student debt, but smartly. Like I too had to take on student debt when I when I uh, went to college. Um, in fact, I chose a college that was more than what my mother like made in a year <laughs> for, for a year of college. So like in hindsight, that probably wasn't the smartest thing for me to do because I had to incur a lot of debt. Um, but the one thing is to think about that debt for higher education. You know, it's really important that the program that you're going to enroll in is actually going to lead to a job with an income high enough to justify that debt, right? So there's there's different ways you could think about that about higher education. The second is housing. You know, I, I don't know many people who can actually pay cash for for a home. Good on you if you can. Um, you know, buying that affordable property. You know, taking out that mortgage in my mind is is a smart use of debt. And for those those of you out there that itemize your taxes, you know, you can write off portions of that, um, that um, interest and property taxes on your federal taxes. And then the last is transportation. Um, you know, here's where I, I tend to take on debt, especially for transportation. I understand they're a depreciating asset and that doesn't really make sense to take on debt. But the reason I do this is, um, is twofold. So, First is I always put a really high down payment, so at least 20% down um, on that on that vehicle. Secondly, I only ever buy certified pre-owned, um, and I usually go to a credit union. I don't go to the dealership for for that loan. I'll go to a, a credit union or check my bank. Typically, credit unions offer really low interest rates. Um, so we recently bought a car about a year ago. Got myself a certified pre-owned, of course. Um, and I had cash, and I was actually thinking of paying cash for that that vehicle. 
However, when I went and talked to, to the, the credit union, they offered me um, a, a 1.99% loan. And so knowing that I could put that cash that I was going to use to pay off the car back into, um, into an investment account, I actually just withdraw from that investment account um, to pay the car payment. And, you know, I'll come out a little ahead. You know, we have, we've had some nice returns in the market. So I'll actually come out ahead once that car is paid off. So, um, you know, I think their their debt makes sense um, if he's, if used wisely. So um, those are the three areas where I really think that like for four actually, where debt can make sense to kind of take on. How about you, Callie? Oh man, I hate that I'm following Nicole on this uh, because she said everything that I was thinking. Uh, so kind of going back to that first this or that, you know, I said, I always take on debt or I shouldn't say that definitively, but I like to take on debt when the rate is very low. And Nicole alluded to this, but, you know, I think of debt as a seesaw versus my investments. So fun fact, the S&P has returned about 8% a year since 1950 on average. So I kind of keep that in mind, you know, think six or 7% just to give myself a little wiggle room. And I think about my debt on one side of the seesaw and then my market returns on the other side of the seesaw. And if my interest rate for my debt is bigger than my market returns, then, you know, I think twice about it because like Nicole said, there is a way to get ahead. If you, you know, maybe put a cash down payment down, good, get good financing terms, and then invest that money that you would, uh, you would have paid cash, paid cash for that asset for. Um, but it's tricky, right? And you have to really be honest with yourself. Can I, am I going to invest that money? Can I make the payments? Can I handle this? Um, and you know, you, again, you really have to be honest with yourself because if you can't do the, do those three things, then it might not work for you. And I'll throw in too, everything that we're saying here, not advice, not a definitive way to do it. It's what works for everybody. So there's a reason why they call it personal finance because it's super, super personal. Uh, so um, you know, different people think about things differently, um, but that's the way that I think about debt. Um, I will throw out too, I like what Nicole said about, you know, using debt for certain things. And I completely agree with her. Um, I like to say, use debt if you need to, um, if you need to get a house, a car, et cetera, uh, within bounds, of course, I mean, don't go wild. And if it betters you. So student loans, for example, um, you know, it's hard to see I mean, college is expensive. I was there just a decade ago. And sometimes it's hard to stomach the fact that you have to take out so much debt. But I believe that your life and your career are compounding returns. So I think in many cases, it does make sense to take out that debt, even though, again, don't go crazy, really think that through, really be smart about it. Um, so yeah, that's my spiel on debt. Again, think about the seesaw. Whenever you're thinking about that debt, imagine me doing this <laughs> and doing the seesaw. All right, Jack, what do you think? Yeah, and when you think about debt, think of me urging you to pay it off, right? Because <laughs> that's kind of where I'm at. Um, I think that you there are times where you're going to need debt. It's no way around it. You want to be a homeowner. You don't have the cash to buy the house, the car, your education. Um, but for me, I think oftentimes people will take out debt and you're just paying it forever. Um, when for me, like as a spender, you could pay the debt Forever and ever, right? You can pay your student loans for 35 years if you want to. Um, but for me, I decided, knowing that I'm a spender, I'm going to take some of that money and pay off that student loan debt aggressively. So, for example, when um, for my grad school program, I got about 50 grand in debt, and it was at a higher interest rate. It was at like 6%. Um, and, six, and that drove me crazy. So I'm one of those, although I'm a spender, I'm one of those people that looks at my net worth like every other day. So knowing that I was giving away that much money in interest, it bothered me. So I paid off that student loan debt within about three years. And that was a big deal for me as a, a spender. That meant that I had to say no to a lot of things. I drove my car, the same car for about 10 years. I had to say no to vacations and other splurgers, but it was worth it to me because I knew that that would create long-term wealth in the future. Um, so again, like Callie said, you got to know who you are and create a plan that works for you. Okay, Callie, when does it make sense to start investing versus saving? All right, so I'm going to go against the grain here. I know people will tell you to go through some steps, like first, save up your emergency fund. Second, make sure you wipe out all your debt. 
and then you start investing. So I think a little bit differently here. My mantra, it's always a good time to start investing. And starting early is crucial. Um, compounding, there's a thing called compounding. It's a mathematical phenomenon where basically gains compound on top of gains, and then you get some nice exponential growth if you give your portfolio time to you know get those gains. Um, so start early. It's so, so important, especially for retirement when compounding is super in your favor because you're starting dec decades before you need those investments and you have some tax advantages there. Um, but, you know, I will say this. I don't necessarily believe in the steps, but you do. If you're starting to invest, I would think concurrently about maybe saving up that emergency fund or wiping out that debt. You might get a bigger bang for your buck by prioritizing savings or by paying off, prioritizing paying off that high interest debt. Um, and emergency funds are also really important. Sometimes it's hard to say like, okay, I'm saving money, but what am I saving for? Because you can't picture that emergency down the road. But when you have that emergency and you don't have that emergency fund, you might have to tap that high interest debt. And then you're dealing with those high interest payments and that's eating into your money that you can invest, that you can save. Um, so. I know it's a tricky question, but you know, I say it's never too early, even if you start just a little bit, like 10 or $20 here and there, never too early to start investing. What do you think, Nicole? Well, I think we finally found something where Callie and I may diverge a little. So, <laughs> um, so really, you know, I, I, let's be honest here. I, I agree with Callie totally with that. You should start investing, you know, as soon as reasonably possible. However, um, just like compounding can help you um, when you're investing, I also look at compounding can really have a negative impact on you on those high interest debts, right? So for me, um, at least my journey uh, was all about getting, making sure that that high interest credit card debt that I got myself in trouble with in my early 20s was at a place where it was now manageable. Um, and so that was the first thing, right? And then the second is obviously the emergency fund. Um, you know, having that built up really also just kind of gave me peace of mind that as I entered and started thinking about investing, um, it wasn't as, as like cumbersome for me. Um, but you know, I like Callie, you know, whether you're 12, 30 or 50, it's never too late. Right. But there's no way your future self is going to regret making that decision, right. To start investing. Um, so, so how do you kind of do that? I think is the, the logical next step. So for me, again, it was about paying off that debt and getting that emergency fund built. And then secondly, um, taking advantage of an employer match. You know, if I was fortunate enough to work for a company that, that offered a 401k and offered a match. So if you're in the same situation, you know, please take advantage of that because um, it's free money. It's, it's a free return to you. Um, so taking, uh, taking advantage of, of the 401k and the match. Um, and then also I realized that while it was important to have that 401k, there were other taxable, like tax advantage options available to me. So when I was pretty, pretty young, um, I actually opened up an IRA and started making small contributions to that, um, as well as, as a 401k. So, um, I just automated those contributions. Um, and then once I felt like I was making an inroads into like my future retirement self, I started taking care of my present day self. And so I, at that point, opened up um, a, a taxable, or a taxable uh, self-directed account. Um, and the funny thing was, when I did that, I was just like, where do I begin, right? Because I've only had ever at that time invested in, in mutual funds. I did um, participate in my employer at the time in their employee stock purchase plan. Also another kind of great way to dip your toe into investing. Um, but I didn't know where to begin, right? I had this account open and I was like, now what? So this may sound a little counterintuitive. I actually went to a financial advisor. I had no money, right? Like I only had money in my 401k. I, I had my, um, um, my emergency fund, but I didn't have sizable assets. So what I did was I found a financial advisor that would charge me just for their time. And so I worked with this person, um, even though, again, I had no money to go to them, um, but just to start creating a plan of, of how I wanna start investing, um, what made sense for me and what my goals looked like. And so I could kind of track myself 
um, to those goals. And that really helped because it gave me the courage. Even though I was a finance major, I worked in the industry, but it gave me the courage with my own money to start investing is to know that I had a plan in place um, and that I was marching towards that plan. And, um, you know, I thought it was just a, a great way to kind of get started. So curious then, Jack, I know we all have had different investing journeys and savings journeys. What was yours? I think I'm in the middle between both of you. So for me, I kind of did everything all at once and automated it. I go back to that. So automating my, you know, paying down the debt, saving for my emergency fund, and then also investing for retirement. I'm a huge fan of investing for retirement, especially if you can get a match from your employer. So back when I was, you know, just yesterday, 23 years old with my first job, I started out only making like $26,000. So I didn't have a lot of money, but I remember even then I would contribute $25 per pay into my 401k. And at the same time, I was paying down debt and all of that. So I kind of did a mixed approach. Um, And as I think about my financial journey since then, my 20s were really spent just trying to understand all of this, right? So like reading books and and audio tapes and things like that to just understand like, what does it mean to have a financial journey and what should I be doing? In my thirties, I really implemented a lot of that by paying down debt, increasing my income. And now I'm just really getting to a place now where I have, you know, I'm maxing out my retirement accounts and now I have enough disposable income to actually start investing outside of out of outside of those um, my retirement accounts so i think it's a journey right and we all um i think you just got to get in there and try um and start early so start early and try all right nicole this is a good one okay planning a wedding versus buying a house oh you asked the most least romantic person on this panel that question um, I, when I got married, I had 14 people at my wedding and uh, we paid for it all. And so frugal me wanted just 14 people. Um, so I'm going to say house all day long. Um, you know, the, the money, and I understand weddings are very expensive. Uh, for me, I'd much rather enter a union with, um, little debt from that, you know, that one particular day and actually have some money, um, that I may have used for a wedding to start saving for a down payment on a house. Um, you know, just think about marriage and marriage, go back to like my first few years of marriage. They're stressful to begin with. Like there's just, it's a stressful time. Um, and just to have like debt issues on top of it from one day, I just think added would add to, uh, add to that stress. And in my mind, I didn't need it. Right. So, um, but I understand like, you know, people want that big day and, and, and that's, that's wonderful. My my only advice on that would be just pick one thing. Right? Pick one thing that you'll splash out on. Um, but again, you've asked a non-romantic <laughs> a question about a wedding or a house, and I'm always going to pick the four walls and the roof. How about you, Callie? Are you the romantic among the group? Oh, man. Okay. I'm a little more romantic than Nicole. And let me just say, too, today's my three-year wedding anniversary, so I'm feeling a little extra romantic and sentimental about this. Uh, so yeah, this is way fresh in my mind. We got married three years ago to the day. Um, and again, super like a little more romanticized. My husband and I actually paid for our wedding, mostly ourselves. And we were fortunate to be able to do that. Um, but we did have to make some really hard decisions on what to keep and what to cut. Um, the thing that I would say here is just remember it's your decision and your day. Um, I understand a lot of people go, you know, look at weddings and they say, you know what, I'm going to do it at the courthouse. You know, I don't need it to be this big old affair. Um, I, we looked at it and we were like, well, we want everybody who we love to be there, uh, you know, watching us make these great promises. Um, so we actually did have a wedding. We had a 150 person wedding. Um, and let me tell you, weddings are expensive. So we had to cut corners a lot. Um, we ended up cutting things like favors, Um, I ended up not getting a videographer, which let me tell you, I'll tell you in a minute. Worse, I actually regret that decision a lot. Um, We cut, we cut a lot of different things. Uh, We cut down our budgets on flowers and stuff. Um, But, you know, in the end, it was a really fun day. We have memories that we'll we'll cherish for a lifetime. 
And, you know, we were able to, you know, make all these promises in front of people we love, which by the way, you can do that without spending a lot of money. Um, so if you're thinking, you know, how do I cut costs for a wedding? You know, how do I save that money for a house? Um, I agree with Nicole. It's never fun to, you know, start your wedding off in some massive amounts of debt. Uh, money can be a big stressor in marriage. So definitely keep that in mind. And that debt should be reserved for, you know, things you need again and things that make you better. Uh, and weddings, unfortunately, to me, don't fall in those buckets. So I, we did not take out debt or, you know, ramp up our credit cards to pay for a wedding. But if you're going to have a wedding and you want to cut costs, I agree with Nicole. Focus on one splurge area. And I'm going to give you a little, little pro tip. That splurge area for us was our photographer. And you know what? I wish I would have splurged a little extra money on the videographer because after the wedding, I was clamoring for more photos and videos. And we ended up not getting a video of our ceremony and it broke my heart. So focus on splurge areas. Remember, it's your day. Everybody will have opinions and there will be pressure, but stick to your guns, especially if you're paying for it. <laughs> uh, that, that's your money. You spend it the way you want. Uh, keep the guests in mind, of course, you don't want to make the people you love uncomfortable during your wedding. Um, but again, you know, find that good balance between guests and yourself. Yeah. So, you know, my perspective, um, I think I'm kind of with you guys. I was, I'm a bit of a romantic, but when I thought about getting married and planning my wedding, which I did it in like six months, I planned my wedding in six months. Um, I wanted a small intimate ceremony, but it morphed into this big event. It was like 250 people and we paid for it ourselves. Um, so with that, similar to both of you, we had to cut a lot of things. And one of those things was the videographer, Callie. So I completely agree with you. I, I regret um, cutting that. But, you know, when you are making such large investments, um, like a wedding, there are things that you can't have everything, right? Um, and I've been to amazing weddings that cost, you know, crazy amounts of, of money. And I've been to weddings that were in a backyard that were just as nice. So, you know, I think, it, you know, focus on making it less about the event and more about the relationship and the people who you want there. Um, and then maybe you can do both. You can have the wedding and stay for a house. Okay. All right. Callie, how about saving for retirement versus paying for your kids' education? Ooh, well, this is a tough one. Um, admittedly, I don't have kids, so I don't, I don't have to think about this very much. But I firmly believe uh, in the saying that you should put on your own oxygen mask first before helping others. Uh, what every flight attendant says when you get on a flight. And what does that mean? Well, make sure you're in a good financial position and then that decision will be a lot easier. Um, I'll throw in too, uh, there are lots of great tax advantage products that can help you save for your kids' college education or even their primary or secondary education. There are 529s, there are tuition locks. Um, you know, there are things out there that can make it a little less burdensome on you, but uh, you know, you can't, I mean, retirement is a big thing. You need, you're going to need a good bit of money for that. And you can't, you know, turn, turn the focus away from that. I know it feels kind of selfish, but I promise you it's not. And your kids need to know that your parent, their parents will be okay in retirement. Um, you also can't take out debt for it. I mean, student loans, they can get kind of hairy, but you can take out debt for education. And I, I mean, as much as I wish that I would have gotten a free ride to college, I mean, paying off student loans has taught me how to, you know, prioritize debt and how to really be financially responsible. Um, so, you know, definitely focus on your own retirement, especially earlier on. I mean, starting early in retirement is so, so important. And, you know, prioritize your kids for sure. And I know it's hard to say because I don't have kids, but prioritize your kids for sure. But prioritize your financial situation over anybody else's. What do you think, Nicole? Yeah, I, I agree with Kelly on this. Like, I think it's really hard for parents to um, put themselves ahead of their kids. And trust me, it, it's okay. Um, in fact, by putting your retirement needs ahead of their college costs, it's, it, it's necessary and it's wise. And it's really thoughtful in the long run. And, and here's why, right? Like the burden of a parent who cannot afford to pay their own expenses is going to far outweigh the challenge for your children to have to pay off some student debt, right? Like um, I'm in this situation now. Um, my mother never prepared for retirement and she, she moved in with us um, about a, a year and a half ago. 
And it has been, it's, it's cumbersome. Like I, I will say that, right. It's cumbersome for, for all parties involved. She doesn't want to be in that situation. We, you know, we certainly didn't anticipate my husband and I being in that situation. So um, there's a couple of ways you could think about it, right? Like one, explore all cost cutting options. Um, you know, there's, if I could do it differently, I probably would have gone to a community college for those first two years and then transferred to a four year university would have been a lot cheaper. Um, you know, I, I had a paid um, internship. I also had part-time jobs. So there's different ways you could think about it. And then what was left to fill in the gaps was, you know, where I took on some of that student debt. But in all reality, if you really want what's best for your kids, ensuring that you're not going to be a financial burden on them down the road, is just really a great place to kind of start this conversation. So it's a tough one to raise, but I appreciate, Jack, that you raised it. Yeah, this one is close to my heart. I have um, two kids, a 12-year-old and a soon-to-be five-year-old. So ensuring that they can go to college and not have the debt that I had when I graduated is a big deal for me. I will say a couple things that I've learned about that process. One, I have several friends who, and this is graduation season now, I have several friends who have um, children that are going to college now, and they did an amazing job with getting scholarships. So I think, you know, really being aggressive and helping your children to find scholarship opportunities should be a goal. Um, and then, you know, that allows you to save for retirement. I definitely think you should save for your retirement first and then look at the 529 accounts. Um, also, you know, a benefit that I've taken advantage of here at Allies, they give money towards the 529 for my kids. So also look at employers who may help you to save for your children's education. That's another opportunity to think about. Okay, we are at time for our great conversation. So ladies, it's so it was an amazing conversation. Thank you for being so transparent. I'm gonna toss it to Brian to see if we have any questions from the audience. Oh, do we have questions? The chat box is going uh, uh, bazonkers, for lack of a better term. Um, so we have a lot of questions that uh, started a little bit early but I'm going to address them to start with. And I'll let, uh, I'll let this one, I'll start with the very first one going to Nicole. Nicole, we have C for Cameron. It says, tips on where to save money for big purchases like down payments for a home, savings, or maybe a super conservative investment portfolio. Basically, where would you put your money to try to save for a home? Yeah, um, well, I just did this. Um, so how timely of a question. I thank you for it. Um, so what we did, um, so two years out, we, we in two years out, we knew we wanted to um, move out of the home we're in now. And so um, for the first year of that, we actually started saving into a very like conservative robo type product um, just to kind of, you know, have a little bit of oomph to it, but also have it protected. Um, and then as we got closer, um, about nine months out of actually beginning the search for house hunting, um, what we did is we took all that money out of um, that conservative uh, robo product and actually put it into a high interest bearing um, savings account. So we were still making a little bit of interest on it, but then we also weren't subject to market fluctuation. And for us, that was really important. Um, so that's kind of how I approached saving for um, a uh, actually for my down payment, which we just closed on the construction loan two weeks ago. So feeling pretty good about that savings. All right. So the next question uh, calls out Jack uh, uh, for, to, for this answer. And, and I think you kind of address this one a little bit, Jack, but if you are young and have a lot of time, wouldn't it be better to mix in investing with extra cash rather than only using it to pay off debt? So I'm going to Address that one to you, Jack. And I know you kind of talked a little bit about that at the uh, end of the event today, but. So the question is when to take on debt? No, uh, the question is if you are young and have time, isn't it better to be mixing in investing with extra cash rather than just using it to pay off debt? Yeah, no, I think you definitely want to um, use your cash to invest, right? Because I, I mentioned earlier, I started in my 401k account back, you know, 20 years ago to allow me to take advantage of compound interest. 
my issue with cash and, and debt is that I tend to be a spender. So I want to also ensure that I have, you know, automation and things in, in, in that are set for me to allow me to not go off the guardrails that I've set for myself. So I think it's a balance. You have to do, you know, figure out what's best for you and create an approach that um, will help you to be successful. All right. So the next one that we have that popped up in the chat box is more of a statement than anything. Uh, uh, Sarah says, how do you aggressively pay off debt and still have a life? Question mark, exclamation mark. So uh, in general, I think we were kind of addressing that throughout this entire panel. So I'm going to come back and I'm going to follow up with CAP 1241. And I'm going to address this one to Callie. Callie, is it worth investing in the stock market right now with the concerns around inflation or is it worthwhile to just wait? Now, I just want to say that we're not meant to be recommendations in general, but I know Callie has some, some, some thoughts on this concept overall, especially in the inflation world. All right, Kathy? Or Kelly, sorry. Oh man, I was going to congratulate you on you know saying the recommendation thing, but you got my name wrong. Uh, anyway, <laughs> that's a great question. Uh, you know, and it's a question a lot of people are thinking about right now. I mean, it's it's tough to think about investing in the stock market when everything feels so uncertain and you know kind of scary. Um, but let me tell you a few things. Okay, first of all, backing up. You need to define your why and define your goals for investing. I'll tell you why that's important for your question. Um, based on your goals, if they are more longer term, and if your why is investing for the long term, then you know what? It might make sense investing in the stock market right now. Again, not advice, but I'll throw a few data points at you. So, um, you know, investing for the long term. So I mentioned earlier, the S&P has averaged about an 8% annual return since 1950. That's been the same case since 1990, 8% annual return. And since 1950, we've had about, gosh, like 30, 10 to 20 to 30% drops in the stock market, um, which seems unnerving. And they are unnerving when they happen. But over the long term, stocks have historically gone up. So if you're a long-term investor, and you are willing to diversify and maybe invest in a portfolio that looks like the market, it might make sense for you to invest. Um, I'll throw out to you that investing is a critical, critical way to build wealth. Um, you can stash your money as much as you want, but inflation, I mean, inflation concerns are a thing and we could see a period of high inflation, but inflation will eat into your cash pile. So you might need to invest it. I mean, if we see inflation of two to 3% over the next few years, um, that's going to hit your cash pile. Uh, but if we see investment returns of, you know, 5% over the next 10 years, 8%, like we've seen since 1990, that's going to counteract that inflation. Um, and the other thing I'll throw out too, I know it's intimidating to, you know, buy when the stock market's at record highs, especially when things feel scary. Uh, but 99% of the time when the S&P 500 has reached a record high, it's reached another record high in the next year. Um, so try not to time the market. Time in the market beats timing the market. You know, harness the power of compounding, and you know, just don't don't think too much about it. Um, you know, there's always going to be something to be concerned about out there. There's always going to be that boogeyman. So you know, don't let that stop you from investing. All right, next one we have Zachary, and I'm gonna because I know Nicole talked a little bit about buying a car. Zachary asks. Interest rates are low right now. Is it worth it to refinance an auto loan? That's interesting. I've never, um, I've never been asked that question. Um, <laughs> so I would say, you know, if if you can find um, somebody who can refinance it at a lower rate than you're paying, and you have more than like two and a half, three years to pay off, like left on that loan, it may make sense. Um, however, you have to be mindful of the cost of that refinancing. So that's why I'm saying you need a long, a longer term um, time horizon on that loan for that um, that to make sense. You don't want the cost of that refinancing to actually do more harm in the long run. So um, again, if you have time, if you have probably more than two and a half to three years left on that loan, and you can find somebody to refinance at a, at a lower rate with very minimal cost. It may be something you want to pursue. All right. So now we have Nikki Moo, and this one's for Jack. Jack, when paying off the mortgage two times per month, are you doubling up or paying the total in two payments? 
So I have, so, I, okay, so two things. I have two separate properties. Um, the mortgage that I have um, for my the home I actually live in, I actually pay the interest payment two weeks, the interest portion of the payment two weeks ahead of the principal. So that's how I deal with that one. I also have a rental property that has a small mortgage and I pay that one. I just cut the mortgage payment in half and pay it every two weeks. So when you have that approach, you end up paying like an additional couple of payments per year, which in the long term, you know, when you have a 30 year mortgage or a 15, I think for that property, I have a 15 year mortgage. Um, it helps to decrease the, the term, how long you have the payment and you get rid of the debt faster. All right. Well, we're getting down to the end of the session here, but let's hopefully we can get two more in. And I'm going to um, open this one up to whoever wants to answer it in general. Okay. So Shay is saying, question, if your salary is 35000 uh, a year, what should my emergency fund be? And I'll leave that up to the panel to whoever wants to answer that one. I'll jump in. Um, so I think your first step is to really take account of your expenses. So for me, I have an Excel sheet that I'm obsessed with. And I look at this thing probably at least once a week where I track my expenses. I also have like a column for a tab for debt, a column for my assets, and then it all totals my net worth. But when you're thinking of creating your emergency savings, you really want to look at, you know, what are your basic needs? So if it's your rent or mortgage, your car payment, all of that, get that list understand what that total is. And then I think having at least six months of that total is a good start. All right, everyone. Well, that's gonna be it for this session. What a great discussion. Next up, we have Boosting Your Money Mojo. And that session will start after a short five minute break. See you then.